going to look absolutely beautiful. I can't wait. It's going to be great. And uh, just thank you so much to everybody for all you've given and done and labored. It's been awesome to see how much everyone's done so much. And, you know, I, the thing I've kind of, uh, I've been having this, I have these, uh, this balance of emotions right now. On the one hand, I have incredible excitement about what God's doing. I'm, I'm so excited about the new building and what God's doing with the Forerunner School and things that are spreading and what the Lord's revealing. I'm, I'm excited that God's glory, I, I just believe we live in the day and the hour when God is pouring out His glory and the, the Lord's ultimate intention is going to be accomplished. We live in that hour when God is going to fulfill His ultimate intention. I, I believe it with all my heart. This is the church's finest hour. I really believe that with everything I have, that we, and we're born for such a time as this, we are born in the greatest time to be alive, in my opinion. Isaiah 60, I'm going to read Isaiah 60, we quoted a lot, I'm just going to read it, Isaiah chapter 60, talking about the times that we live in, Isaiah chapter 60, it describes exactly what we are going through here, even in America. And this is the word of the Lord. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Think about that right now. The church, this is your finest hour. You were born for this moment. Don't shrink back. Don't shrink back. You were born for this moment. Arise and shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That's the good news. Amen. That is awesome news. God's glory has come, and God's glory is increasing. Now, the not so good news is, behold, deep darkness will cover the earth, or darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you, and His glory will appear upon you. See, we live in the best of times and the worst of times. I mean, America is on fire right now. And Angie and I, we've been kind of joking around. I've, I've been a little bit grumpy lately, thinking about all the stuff that's going on. And, you know, you've probably seen that Snickers commercial, maybe you have, where the person's really hungry and they're incredibly grumpy and all they need is a Snickers. And so Angie, every time I'm talking, she's like, you're really like Eeyore right now. You're really gloomy. You need a Snickers, and so that's kind of been our joke. And so, you know, in this message today, I do believe the Lord's given me a word, and I, I should have actually brought Snickers for everybody, and if I start getting a little doom and gloom, just hold up the Snickers for me and remind me, okay, you're being a little bit pessimistic, and, I, and I'm, that's not my intention whatsoever. But my heart is to capture what the Lord is saying. That, that's really what my heart is is what is the Lord saying right now to His church? And I know most of us, we have come into the year 2020, and most of us wish there was such a thing as time travel so we could go back six months. I mean, here we are six months into 2020, and we have, you know, I'm sure all of us are so sick and tired of the phrases, it's a new normal, or wear a mask, flatten the curve, you know, we're all in this together. You know, how many of you are sick of that? Social distancing, I am tired and sick of all of that. Now, I know there's a place we need to do that. But, you know, this 2020 has been a not-so-great year, right? I mean, if you've liked 2020, raise your hand. Just kidding. So, you know, if we, there was such thing as time travel, we would go back in time, back to 2019, back to maybe six months into 2019, right? So... You know, you think, I started writing down the, some of the things that have happened in about five months. So, some of the things that have happened in five months. Think about this. We've witnessed a global pandemic. We've witnessed swarms of locusts in Africa. We've witnessed an economic conditions that, are, that rival the Great Depression. Fifty million Americans are unemployed right now. Riots, lawlessness, anarchy, a Marxist revolution that wants to destroy America and the Constitution, government overreach, 
you know, uh, Chaz, Chop, or whatever the name is in Seattle, all this craziness that has hit our country, the, you know, the, with the coronavirus, you know, if, it's absolutely a real thing, but the whole thing has become so political, you don't know who's telling the truth from the right or from the left. Both have an agenda in this. And so you're like, what is even, I don't know if you feel that way, I certainly do, what, what is even the truth right now? Uh, I mean, what is really going on? You know, I don't, I'm, I'm, I question both sides, right and left, because both have an agenda. What's really happening in our country? And, you know, just the government banning people, churches from singing and uh, just, all that we've seen, the sports and entertainment coming to a screeching halt. I mean, college football may not play this year. Man, that would be tough for me. And maybe God's trying to deal with that in me. But man, <clears throat> you know, just God, you know, thing, everything has been turned upside down in about five months of time. It's the craziest time we've ever lived in, isn't it? And so... You know, not to mention the Supreme Court Act that was just uh, happened just recently where they, they expanded from the, the bench the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to include sexual orientation and how you identified in a gender, gender identification. And so that is going to be the driving force behind religious persecution in the days ahead. So we, we live in that time. That's just, and I'm not trying to make people afraid or make people like, you know, we want to get out of here. This is the time we live in. You know, not to mention the media and all that's going on. The riots take place and you think, okay, what happened to the coronavirus? It was gone for three weeks and now, and now it's back and all that's going on. It's like, you can't, I don't know if you feel this way, but you can't, it's a, it is so difficult to find out what is true and what is false. What is true news and what is fake, fake news. And so, my concern as a pastor is not so much what's going on in the world, but what is the Lord saying in this hour? That's where I'm trying to bring this to is, Lord, what are you saying in this hour? You know, Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. What is the Lord saying to the church? That's my heart. That's where I'm coming from is I'm just really waiting on the Lord to say, okay, Lord, what are you doing? What are you saying in this hour? I think one of the things, that, one, the, the, the big thing God is doing right now is he is ex exposing the church. He's showing us not, this whole 2020 has shown us this is what is the church is like. The Lord's heart is not to do that as an angry, mean God. The Lord is doing this because He loves us very, very much. And He does not want us to miss out on His ultimate intention. His glorious ultimate intention. God does not want us to miss out on that. And Jesus told the church of Laodicea, He said, he said, those whom I love, I discipline and I reprove. And that word discipline means child training. It, and the Lord's coming with his love. This is, a, this is an incredible act of God's mercy to expose the church and our true condition right, right now. So we have time to repent. And so we have time to change, like Dad prayed. So we have time to be aligned with God in what He's doing in this hour. I don't want to miss the Lord. I don't want my doctrines or my comfortable lifestyle or whatever it is, my American nationalism or whatever it would be, my college football, I don't want any of that to get in the way of what God is doing and what God is saying. God's moving in a way that we're probably none of us are familiar with right now. All of us, every, all leaders are right now just going, okay, what is God doing? What is God saying? We've got to hear the Lord and what He's doing and what He is saying. And I, I believe, and I've been saying this from the beginning, that 2020 so far has been a test run for the church to find out where we are and to show, the Lord knows where we are, but to show us where we are. And I'm talking about the global church, which we would be included in that. 
You know, I've been doing software development for over 20 years, since about 1995, 25 years. And one of the things about software development is when you do software development, you always, you know when you're done, okay, there's bugs in this system. There's things in this system that don't work. There's things in this system that need to be tested. And so you know you're going to run it through about a six, you know, three to six month time of testing and analysis and just really trying to find the faults in it and all that. That's like what the Lord's doing right now. Through this 2020 crisis, the Lord is testing the church, not because he's mad, but because he wants to find out where we are buggy. He wants to find out. He wants us. To, he knows that. He, he wants us to see we need to change this area or these areas or this belief system or this way we're living so we can be in alignment with him in the hour we live in. We live at the end of the age. I'm not saying Jesus is going to come back tomorrow, but I, I mean, we certainly live at the end of the age, and we want to be in alignment with what God himself is doing at the end of the age. Don't we? I do. I absolutely want to be aligned with him. And so I believe that God is presently, now I want you to catch this, God is presently judging the church in America. And that would mean God is judging us. That's not because he's mad. It's not because he wants to condemn us. He wants us to see the truth and he wants us to repent and get in alignment with him. It's a sober hour we live in. Now, I have joy. I, I do. I have the joy of the Lord. But it is also a sober time. We have never lived in, the, in a time like we are living in right now. And I don't think it's going to get better anytime soon. I'm not being doom and gloom. I, I'm just saying I think we're in for a time of shaking in this nation. And so what God, now I want you to hear this. This is, this is in your scripture. See, the, the, a lot of the church doesn't teach this anymore, but it's right here in 1 Peter 4.17. I want you to see it. And Peter is talking about the end of the age, and he's talking about God's judgments coming upon the world, the unbelieving world. And Peter says in 1 Peter 4.17, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. God's judgment does not begin in the world. It begins in the church. And so if God is going to judge the nations, and if he's going to judge America, and if he's going to judge, you know, different nations, he's first going to come to the church in judgment. Not because he, he's mad or angry, but because he loves us. Because he's training us as children to become mature sons. God is coming to the church in judgment. The judgment begins with the household of God. There's a doctrine floating around in the church today that says that God does not judge anymore. And that's absolutely unscriptural. Absolutely unbiblical. God does still judge, and he's coming to the church. He wants us to be in alignment with him. Isaiah 26, verse 9 says that when the earth experiences your judgments, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. See, God is shaking America. God is shaking the nations right now. Because there are only things, there's certain things we can't hear, we can't learn unless we have God really in our face shaking it. And see what it says the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness when God releases his judgments. And those judgments come first to the church. And so. You know, there, there's, there's about five areas I want to talk about that I believe that, that this, this present shaking of 2020 has revealed in the Church of America. And these five areas, you know, the, the Lord is, is showing 
this because he knows the times we live in. And in fact, he looked at the, relig the religious leaders of his day and he said to them, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he said to them, you can tell the weather patterns and you can tell if it's going to rain and you can tell all this stuff. You can forecast what's coming, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. We've got to discern the signs of the times. America, this is, to, in my opinion, we've had the Revolutionary War, we've had the Civil War. I believe we are entering in a time in American history that rivals those two milestone events in our nation's history. I could be wrong, but that's what I believe the time we live in. And so the Lord wants us to discern the times and the seasons because God wants us to be on his side. You know, the, just like in, in uh, uh, Joshua chapter 5, you know, Joshua is bowing down and the Lord appears to him and he says, are you on our side? Or are you on their side? And God says, or, or the mighty warrior says, I'm on neither God's not on our side or America's side. God is on his own side, and he's wanting us to be in alignment with what he's doing. Amen? And so God has to come in confrontation mode to the church. The first area that I think 2020 has exposed is that, is that consumer Christianity is not going to survive God's end-time shakings. Consumer Christianity, basically what we've had in America for the most part for about 50 years or longer, consume, probably longer, consumer Christianity where we go to church and church to us is an event we go to or church to us is a service we attend or church to us is something we do on Sunday and then we go and we live the way we want to live the rest of our lives and, and think that we're, we're okay and right with God. That paradigm and model, God is saying, you know, I'm, I believe God is killing consumer Christianity. Right now, most churches, you, you, you know, you, you can hardly meet right now. And I believe the Lord is in that. I believe the Lord is saying something in that. I believe the Lord is saying you know, church was never meant to be a place you go to two hours a week. Church was meant to be the body of Christ, having the Christ and his indwelling life overflowing out of your own relationship with the Lord interdependently to express his life together. See, it's so much more than just worshiping and, and singing songs and, and hearing a message. God is looking for so much more. God is looking for a body together that expresses Christ and his life organically. And I've been listening. I've been doing a lot of listening and, and just, just trying to get the pulse of the church and and just listening to where people are at and and just you know trying to understand okay and I'm look I'm talking about the evangelical church the charismatic church the pentecostal church and I'm just trying to see okay what is the church leadership saying what is god you know what do they feel the lord is saying and you know to be honest a lot of the church is just has this attitude well this is just one of those pandemics that sweeps by every 100 years we're in a highly political season in America. Nothing's really changed. And they're not discerning the signs of the times that we could very well be in one of the most historic times in American history. We could very well be in one of those moments leading to the return of the Lord. And a lot of, and from what I've listened to, a lot of the church leadership, in the, especially in the evangelical church, has been, well, we can't really meet in person good right now, so we're just going to take it online and make that experience bigger and better. Yeah. Instead of seeing the Lord is confronting the wineskin of the church. And the, and the Lord is confronting them. He's doing this with love. He's doing this with his mercy, knowing that the wineskin of the present day church cannot sustain the shakings of the end times that are coming. And he's using the least severe means he can use to wake up the church. But unfortunately... In my, in my experience, not many are hearing it. Their, their attitude is kind of like Isaiah chapter 9. The bricks have fallen down, but we are going to rebuild them with smoother stones. 
The sycamores have been cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. In other words, God is tearing something down right now. And we are trying to rebuild bigger and better what God's tearing down. Now, that does not mean we shouldn't have a good online experience. We should. I think every, every, every church should. But God is looking for something so much bigger and better than just an event we go to. He wants the ecclesia, the church, to become all that God has meant for it to be. And so I go into a lot more detail in the message I did on con called Consumer Christianity, and I would highly recommend you, you look at that if you're under, not sure of that term or what I mean by that. I go into all the details of that, but God wants to break us of that consumer Christianity, especially in the Western church. Number two, the second thing I think God is, this, this shaking is exposing is that human wisdom is not going to get us through God's end time shakings. Human wisdom is not going to get us through God's end time shakings. And again, I said I've been listening and reading so much recently of just get the pulse of the church. And I, I heard a very influential uh, pastor. And this pastor was on a podcast explaining some different things. And, and he said... He basically explained his leadership style, and he says, I, I will not, I am not the type, I'm paraphrasing this, I am not the type of leader, and I don't advise anyone to be the type of leader that goes into your prayer closet, hears from God, and then charges out and says, okay, this is what God has said, let's go do it. Now, you know, I'm not saying you should, you know, as a leader, you should just automatically go into your prayer closet you know, hear from God and, you know, dogmatically, this is what God's saying, we're going to do it. Now, the, you know, there is, a, the wisdom is in a multitude of counsel, but basically what I heard from that was, we're going to lead by human wisdom. We're going to gather together the leaders and through our own human wisdom, we're going to discuss together what we should do and what we should do going forward. And see, what, I'm, what I want to say is we've got to hear God. Leadership has to hear the voice of God. What is the Lord speaking? What is the Lord saying? We're living in a time right now that we have never lived in before in human history. I mean, I don't want to make it overly dramatic. There's been tons of things in America, in our lifetime. Let me phrase it that way. We're living in a time that we have never lived before in our lifetime. And hearing from God is so, so important. And I just, you know, just want to say a, a word, of, a great word about Dad. You know, I've learned so much from Dad. But one of the things I've learned from Dad is we are not going to be led by human wisdom. We're going to pray and we are going to seek God for what he is saying. And, I, and you, you probably have heard the story before, but they, it was probably 20-something years ago or so. Now, yeah, probably about 20 years ago where... We, you know, I had gotten a hold of some material about a seeker sensitive church, and I started reading the material about, the, about building a seeker sensitive church where you're basically trying to, you, you, you know what that all means. And, and so, you know, anyway, dad was trying to correct me and say, no, we're not going in this way. And then he told Noel, you know, our, our spiritual father, Noel, about that. <laughs> and Noel comes up. And he's here, and Noel definitely doesn't have any fear of man. I'll never forget, I was sitting probably right back there in that corner. Or no, about right there. And I, I still remember what I had on. I had a, a green polo shirt on, and Noel came back to me, and he pulled me by the collar and stood me up, and he said, you are not going to build a seeker-sensitive church. And I'm like, okay, all right, I get the point. But he was basically saying... You are not to build by human wisdom. And I think, sadly, we're witnessing the fruit of 50 years in America of church leaders building by human wisdom and not by the Holy Spirit. And what we're finding right now is the church right now is so unequipped and prepared for the hour we live in. And that's why we're doing the forerunner school. That's why... 
you know, we, we believe there's such an urgent need for forerunners who will know how to hear God speak, who will be led by the Spirit of God, who are not operating out of the human wisdom of the carnal mind and gathering together a bunch of leaders and operating out of wisdom. We need to hear God. What is God speaking? What is God saying? God is moving in a direction we've never gone before. And so I just want to encourage everyone that's listening to this, really go to forerunnerschool.org and, and check out the Forerunner School that we're doing because we've got to know what God's agenda is in this hour. It's really not confusing, but it has become confusing because of so many voices out there trying to confuse, or not trying, but confusing people. So God's uh, human wisdom is not going to get us through God's end time shakings. The third one, do I need a Snickers yet? Am I good? Uh, anyone? You guys, you guys still out there, hopefully? Um, number three is, and this, this is a big one, false beliefs about the end times are going to cause many to be unprepared. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge one right now. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. How many of you have heard of the dreams by Dana Corverstone from Kentucky? The rural pa Let me see. The rural pastor from Kentucky. So, okay, so I'll just summarize it real quick. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll keep it brief. My point isn't to get into whether it's the Lord or not the Lord. I have a different point. But in, in the dream, Dana Corverstone had a series of, of dreams and uh, December of, starting in December of 2019, and in, in the dream, he's watching, and a calendar starts flipping through the year 2020, and it lands on March, and a finger in the dream points to March. And that's when, of course, the coronavirus hit, and especially in America, was in March. Then the calendar begins to flip more and more, and it lands in the month of June, and the finger points and says, no, we're not saying anything, just points to the month of June. Then it begins to go again, and it, it lands in September. And then when it gets to November, all of a sudden, an, a fist comes out and punches November, and chaos breaks out. Just to, just to keep it simple, he said it was 100 times more intense than what has already happened. And so... Anyway, uh, it go, he goes through and talks about that through this, there, there's coming persecution in America. There's coming economic shaking, all this different stuff. And I, if you want to, you can Google it and, and hear it for yourself. My point isn't right now to say, is this the Lord or is this not the Lord? My point is to say, I have listened to so many different, quote unquote, prophetic responses of, of saying this, whether this is the Lord or not the Lord. And what I've heard is this. The, the, one of the things that becomes really, really clear to me is this. And then there's been probably, I don't know the percentage, but a vast majority in the charismatic church have heard these dreams and rejected it as possibly being from the Lord. And the number one reason for that, or not the, not the number one reason, a big reason, is the way they... They, their interpretation, their, their uh, doctrines about the end times. And that's, what's, that's what burdens me because, you know, we'll, time will tell if this is the Lord or not the Lord, but time will tell about that. But my concern was the, how many people speaking and influencing millions of people in the prophetic movement automatically said, okay, this is not the Lord. This is not the Lord. And that concerned me because what, what, it, what they were doing is they were filtering these dreams through their grid of how they interpret end-time prophecy. And that, that causes us not to be able to hear from God. Because if we view the end times that things are only going to get better and that the kingdom of God is going to increase until it fills the earth before Jesus comes back, then if we hear negative things, our grid system automatically says, this can't be from God because it doesn't fit into my theology. You see what I'm saying? And so my burden was, okay, it is really vital 
that we understand for ourselves what we believe about the end times. Not what I believe. I don't want you to believe what I believe. I want you to get into the scriptures for yourself and study the scriptures for yourself. What does the Bible say about the end of the age? Um, and, and really one of the, one of the leading proponents that's, that's causing great deception is what's called or rebranded as victorious eschatology. Eschatology means the study of the end times, but it's, it's called victorious eschatology. Basically, the idea is that things are not getting worse, they are getting better. And the idea is that the kingdom of God is going to keep on increasing and increasing and increasing until the kingdom of God takes over all the different mountains of culture before Jesus comes back. I just don't see that in the scriptures. It's really a combination of what scholars call preterism and postmillennialism. Preterism meaning that a significant number of prophecies in Matthew 24 and, Revel and the book of Revelation were fulfilled in 70 AD. And that, you know, all the people who believe that it's still in the future are these doom and gloom people who are pessimistic and negative, and they have this bad view of God that he's mean and angry, and he's basically, you know, anything that doesn't fit that grid, that, that interpretive uh, model, they reject as possibly being from the Lord. My point is this, is we have to know what we believe about the end times. See, the scripture says, study to show yourself approved unto God. See, I'm concerned that the great concern I have is millions of people have embraced victorious eschatology, thinking that, that, that God is not going to shake the earth, that God has already done that in 70 AD. And so they're, they're therefore not preparing themselves for what's coming. They're not preparing themselves for the hour we live in. They, you know, so they look at that, the, the dreams from Pastor Dana, and they go, no, that's just the enemy's plans. That could not be God. That could not be God. And I'm not, I'm not saying it is or it isn't right now in this message, but that could not be God because it's scaring the bride. It's creating fear. There's not hope in it. So it can't be the Lord. What, what's really happening is the way they interpret the prophetic scriptures is filtering into how they're hearing from God. And so I'm reading through a book right now, Victorious Eschatology, and you know, I'm, this is one of the things we're going to talk about in our Forerunner School. We're going to go into the detail of that, is why a belief system such as preterism, which is the really the belief that these prophecies have been fulfilled, why this is unscriptural. And, and it's really, if you really examine it, I, I mean, I, I've went through and looked at their arguments, and some of their arguments, I'm just going, how can you say this stuff? How can you teach God's people these false things? You know, and this one guy was trying to say, well, things are really only getting better. And I'm like, okay. And he was comparing it from 70 AD. And I'm like, what about uh, World War I and World War II where like 60 million people died? Um, you know, things are not getting, I mean, some things absolutely are getting better for sure. You know, and, and we live in, in an incredible time of prosperity in America. But, you know, there's a lot of things that are not getting better. Uh, so, and I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. I'm just saying we've got to know the truth of what we believe. That's why I think the Forerunner School is we need to know for ourselves. Because I want to tell you, if you were to hear some of the leading proponents that would listen to the dream and say, why is it not from the Lord? If you don't know the scriptures, you would be swayed by their reasoning and their opinion. So you've got to know for yourself, okay, what do the scriptures teach? This is what this view says. This is why this view says that, but what in the what does what does the scriptures teach? Why is preterism not scriptural? Why is postmillennialism not scriptural? Why is amillennialism not scriptural? All these words sound like these big scholarly words, but I'm telling you, they have incredibly practical benefit and a, a relevance to your life right now. We need to know what the scriptures teach. So have I left anything unturned? Uh, let's see. Number four, many are going to be offended at God when he shakes the earth. This is another big concern I have. 
This is a big concern I have. Those who embrace victorious eschatology don't have to wrestle with the, the paradox of Jesus being the lion and the lamb. See, when you say all those prophecies were fulfilled around 70 A.D. when Rome destroyed Jerusalem and Israel, if, if that's your belief system, you don't really have to wrestle with Revelation chapter 5 when the Lamb comes, the Lamb who died for our sins comes and breaks the seven seals, and those seven seals release God's judgment of increasing intensity until He comes back. See, you don't have to deal with that dichotomy. You don't have to deal with the difference between the Lion and the Lamb. It's the same person. God never suspends one of His attributes to exercise another. Uh, A.W. Tozer said that. The lion is always the lamb, and the lamb is always the lion. But see, if we believe that, we, that things are only going to get better, that, that God is, the kingdom of God is only going to fill the earth, and there's no antichrist, and there's no time of tribulation, then we don't have to really wrestle with this view of God. What Paul said, he called it the severity of God. He said in Romans chapter 11, Behold, the kindness and the severity of God. We want to know, who, if you really want to know the Lord as He is, not by your doctrines, but who He is as the person, there is in Him both kindness and severity. I want to know Him as He is. I don't want my doctrines to interfere with that. I want to read to you here, a word that Jeremiah Johnson had, I think in about the year 2015, where he had a, a, an encounter with the risen and glorified Christ. And he, he describes it as a very fearful, sober encounter. And, and the Lord told him, this is what the Lord told him, Many know the Lamb who went to Calvary, but few know the Lion who is returning to devour his father's enemies. The same wrath that was poured out in mercy and grace on the cross will be the same wrath poured out in judgment at, his re at my return. I want you to hear this. Many will be offended at my return. And he's talking about the church, not just the world. Many of God's people will be offended when he returns. They have created a God in their own likeness and image. And they will deny me when I come with all my glory, power, and splendor. You must warn the church of the scoffing spirit that will come, of the overemphasis of my goodness and never teaching on my severity, of never proclaiming my and warning of my wrath and judgment that is here now and is yet to come. That concerns me. That, that's why I'm saying this. A lot of the church has a revelation of God's love, rightly so. A revelation of God's goodness, rightly so. God is love. God is good. God is kind. Far beyond any of us could ever imagine. God is unfathomably kind and loving. And, you know, just the times when I've, I've experienced God's love, you just weep and weep and weep at the overflow of God's love. There's nothing like God's love. God is incredibly good. God is so good beyond our wildest imagination. But Paul said, if we want to be scriptural, if we want to be biblical, if we, want, if we don't want to create an image of God and preach another Jesus, which, by the way, many are preaching another Jesus. It's, it's only the revelation of Jesus and His love, and only the revelation of Jesus and His kindness, and not the full revelation as Scripture reveals See, if we, want to, if we don't want to worship an idol of what, Jesus, what we want Jesus to be based on the culture, we've got to understand that He is also the lion. He is also releasing judgments to the church and in the earth. Now, this is never meant to bring us under condemnation. It's meant to put the fear of God in us, all right? 
I think I've said it enough here that God never condemns us. God never wants us to feel condemned or come under a condemnation. But He does want to discipline us. And He does want the fear of the Lord to come on us. And He does want to confront us to be in, because He loves us so much and wants us to be in alignment with Him. See, Jesus said, blessed is he who is not offended at me. Blessed is he who is not offended at me. I think a lot of the church today is doing what Jeroboam did in the Old Testament. If you read it, I'm not sure, I think it's 1 Kings 17, 8, no, no, it's 1 Kings 12, thanks. 1 Kings chapter 12 Basically, there was a system of worship that God had established in Judah, in Jerusalem. And in the northern kingdom of Israel, Jeroboam said, okay, well, my kingdom is going to be negatively impacted if the people start going down to Judah, so I'm going to create my own system of worship. And he, in fact, he resurrected the golden calf that Moses had established in Exodus, or that, not Moses, Aaron and the people established in Exodus, saying, this is our God, this is Jehovah, we will worship him. We're going to fashion an image of God out of our own understanding out of our own human wisdom. And they created an entirely different system of worship that was basically false worship. See, we want to know the Lord as He is. Jesus said that, that many are going to be offended at the end of the age. Many are going to be offended and fall away. We don't want to be offended at God. We want to work through, to, just to be honest, you have to wrestle with this. You have to wrestle with the idea of how can a God of love, how can a God of kindness, how can a God of incredible goodness, and we all know the Lord in that way, right? So I know the Lord in that way. Some people think, well, you're preaching about this. You just need to know God's love. I know God's love. I can know God's love deeper, I'm sure. I know God's kindness. I can know, and I need to know His goodness better. I'm sure all of us do. But sometimes people think, you just need to know God's love a little bit better. You just need to know God's kindness a little bit better. I'm thinking, well, maybe you might need to know His severity. Maybe you might need to know His justice, His judgment, the fear of God. We all need to grow in who He is. But see, if, if the Lord is moving in this hour contrary to the way we want Him to move, are we going to be offended at God because He does not fit into our little doctrinal box of the way we want Him to be? I want the Lord in His fullness. I want the Lord as He is. Number five, you guys are quiet, I understand. Uh, you still there? You still want me to stop? <laughs> Number five, there is a deceiving spirit in the prophetic movement. There is a deceiving spirit in the prophetic movement. And if you were to listen, I don't know if, you, if anyone listened to some of the rebuttals to the dreams of saying that wasn't from God. If you listened, to, I, I listened to, to, to probably five or more. If you listen to it, some of the arguments you're going, okay, you know, it's confusing. It's confusing. Because what we have right now in the church, in the, I'm talking about the charismatic prophetic movement, is we have a significant tribe in the body of Christ saying there's no way this could be from God. And another much smaller tribe that says, well, this could be from God. And again, I'm not saying it is from God or isn't. I'm not getting into that. My point is, it could be from God, but the prophetic movement right now, there's deception influencing millions of people right now. That's my concern. And so just listening through that, just listening to some of the, here's some of the arguments that people have said why this can't be from God. Number one is clearly, and I've heard this from one of them, this is their doctrines of eschatology. One of them said, look, this can't be from God because I believe in victorious eschatology. So the way they interpret it, 
they, they say it can't be from God. The others say, well, it creates fear and doesn't offer hope, and there's not redemption. Jesus would not scare his bride. And I'm thinking, okay, I, one, of, one of the explanations was Jesus would not scare his bride, and I'm thinking, okay, what about the book of Revelation? <laughs> I'm like, John, what John wrote about, and he sent it to the seven churches, how can you possibly come up with Jesus would not, some kind of language, Jesus would not scare his bride? That just does not fit with Scripture. Now, obviously, God is not trying to make us afraid. He wants us to have a fear of God. But he, is, he has no problems telling us the truth of what's coming. And he wants our hope to be in him. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 8, the Lord said, you are, you are not to fear what the world fears. All the world is saying, you know, it's, an, it's a conspiracy, it's a conspiracy. But you are not to fear what the world fears. You are not to be in dread of what the world dreads. It is the Lord of hosts whom you shall fear, and it is the Lord of hosts whom you shall dread. The only fear we should be moving in is in the fear of God. So Jesus has no problem telling the church the truth. And he would say, don't fear the one who can cast your body and your soul. Or he says, don't fear the one who could cast your body into hell. Fear the one who could cast your soul into hell. Don't fear the one who can kill your body. Fear the one who can cast your soul into hell. The Lord thinks differently than we do, obviously. God wants our fear to be in him. God wants the fear. God does not want us moving by fear. God wants us moving by faith, and our fear should be in the Lord himself. He is the one we should fear. Another one said that this, this pastor has consumed, he reads like 40 different newspapers a day. So because he read 40 newspapers a day, that negativity infiltrated into his dreams and he saw secondhand revelation. He's, he's focusing on the giants in the land instead of God's promises. Uh, you know, others were like, well, all the people in our prophetic circle haven't been hearing anything like that. Therefore, this can't be from God. Well, what if God decided to bring in a nameless, faceless prophet, and, or, or not even a prophet, a, a pastor who's leading a church in Kentucky that's like 80 members and gives them these dreams? Why couldn't God do that? And so my point is, I believe there is great deception right now in the prophetic movement. And it reminds me of what happened in uh, 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Kings chapter 22, Micaiah. If you know the story, what's happening is there, Ahab is saying, we're going to go to war. We need to go to war against our enemies. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, says, okay, well, what I would recommend is before you go to war, you need to inquire of the prophets. What are the prophets speaking? What are the prophets saying? And Ahab goes, okay, well, let's gather 400 prophets. So they gather 400 prophets of the Lord, and they all begin to prophesy over Ahab. Ahab, you are going to succeed. Ahab, you are going to prosper. Ahab, you are going to have a breakthrough. Sounds a lot like the prophetic movement today, in my opinion. 400 of them in agreement are prophesying over Ahab, you are going to have success. You are going to have prosperity. You are going to prevail. But then there's a guy named Micaiah. He would be a troubler of Israel. In fact, Ahab said to him, he said, I don't like this guy, Micaiah. I'm sure probably you think that about me some, but that's okay. Micaiah never prophesies anything pleasant to me. Micaiah never prophesies a good word to me. His words are always negative. And he calls in Micaiah, and Micaiah comes up to Ahab, and he says, Ahab says, what's the word of the Lord for me? And Micaiah says, go in peace, and you will prosper. And Ahab comes back and says, wait, you never prophesy like that over me. Tell me the truth, Micaiah. And Micaiah says to Ahab, I see all of Israel scattered on the mountains like a sheep without a shepherd. Basically, if you go into battle, Ahab, you're going to die. Israel's going to be wiped out. And sure enough, Ahab did not heed the word of the Lord, and he was killed in battle. 
But what's even more disturbing was this, is Micaiah had a vision. And in the vision, that this, is, this is really something that's disturbing. Micaiah had a vision, and in the vision, there was a deceiving spirit. And the Lord said, what do you want? And he said, I want to go and be a voice of deception in the mouth of your prophets. And God allowed him to be that. Well, how, how could God possibly do that? Read it in for yourself, 1 Kings 22. How could, how could God possibly send a deceiving spirit into the mouth of his prophets? These were not prophets of Baal. These were not demon prophets. These were <laughs> prophets of God. How, how could that happen? How could that happen? How, how could that take place? Well, this is what Paul said. This is in, you know, some people will go, well, that's just old covenant. You just got a doom and gloom mindset. Well, no, not really. The new covenant, Paul said that those who don't love the truth, God, not the devil, will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. I'm telling you, a spirit of deception is in the prophetic movement in the charismatic church right now. Be very careful who you listen to. Now, I think we need to not just listen to two or three people or five people. I think we need to hear what everyone's saying. But be very, uh, here's what I'm warning us for. Be very careful of the, dece the, the deceiving spirit that has been released not by the devil, but by God, because prophets don't love the truth. And so I was asking the Lord about this a couple weeks ago, just, just really troubled. I'm, I'm troubled by this. I really am troubled by this. I am, if you can't tell. You probably can tell. I don't hide my emotions very well, but never have. Um, I was asking the Lord about this. Okay, Lord, I know these people love you. I really know, I know these people love you. I, I know they do. And I don't want to be critical, but I, I'm just not agreeing with their, their arguments to say why this couldn't be the Lord. <clears throat> and the Lord just gave me this, or spoke to me this. I'm going to read it here. There is an entire camp an entire tribe in my body who were like Peter when I was going to the cross. Peter, for selfish purposes, because he wanted an earthly Messiah to defeat Rome and make Israel great, tried to hinder me from going to the cross. His mind and heart were not set on me, but him. Not on heaven, but on earth. And what seemed like compassion, I want you to hear this, what seemed like compassion, Peter was, was saying, Lord, no, God forbid that you would go to the cross. God forbid, my Lord, that you would go to the cross. That seemed like human compassion, and it was human compassion. It was human compassion. What seemed like human compassion, trying to prevent me whom he loved from dying, was actually satanic. You remember what the Lord told him. He said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. Your mind is not set on the interest of God, but on the interest of man. I think God would be speaking that very same thing to a significant portion in the prophetic movement today. The Lord went on and said, this tribe is like Peter. They love me. They serve me. They move in miracles like Peter did. I'm using them, but they want glory before the cross. They want a crown before crucifixion. They want heaven before tribulation. 
And like Peter, they have become a voice of mixture, confusing my people. Because their hearts and their interests are set on themselves, on an earthly kingdom, on heaven coming to earth, apart from me being on the earth, this self-interest and self-focus that denies the cross and the death of what they love and cherish has opened the door for them to be a voice that is mixed and energized by demonic power. They are saying peace, peace when there is no peace. They are trying to superficially comfort my people when I have not spoken to them. I know this is not an easy word. <laughs> But God is jealous for his purposes to be accomplished in the times we live in. And God is not doing this and saying these kind of things because he's angry and mean. He wants the end time church to be all that God wants it to be. He wants us to stand strong in the end times. He wants us to partner with him. He wants us to be for him and not against him. He wants us to be on his side, not our own side, not even what's called the church and their side. We've got to be for our allegiance has to be with the lamb. Our allegiance has to be with the lion. It cannot be with any movement. It cannot be with any man's kingdom. It cannot be with any stream in the church. It has to be with Jesus himself. And Jesus himself is outside of the church for the most part knocking to come in. But we can't say, Jesus, you can come in, but only according to this little box we're going to fit you into. You can't come in. You have, to, you have to be good if you come in to this box. Now, he is good. Do you understand what I'm saying? We've got to allow him in as he is to do whatever he wants to do. May God... Bring forth end time messengers. That's why we're doing the forerunner school. That's why God has called us to do the forerunner school is, is we want to raise up end time messengers anointed with the spirit and the power of Elijah. How desperately we need voices in this hour to give clarity to the confusion that is going through the body of Christ right now. There is deception everywhere right now. And God is raising up forerunners in the spirit and the power of Elijah. God is raising up messengers who will go before him and prepare the way and be a voice of truth, not worrying about what people think, not worrying about if we're going to offend that person or this person, speaking the truth of what God is saying to the church in this hour. We need that so bad. That's why we're doing it. I just want to encourage you, really prayerfully consider being a part of this. Get equipped. God needs messengers. God needs intercessors. God needs partners who are not fighting against his will, even though we love him, even though we do miracles, even though we've done great things for him. God is moving right now in a different way. And if our old wineskins are not put to the side and, and actually just smashed to pieces, we are going to miss the Lord in this time. Like Jesus told the religious leaders of his day who love God, by the way, who study the scriptures night and day, you did not recognize the hour of your visitation. God is visiting his church right now. Now, I believe God is going to release a third great awakening that is greater than we could ever imagine. I believe God is going to release a great awakening throughout America. But I believe that before the great awakening comes, this is what I believe the Lord spoke to me, that there is coming a great shaking that will lead to a great awakening. The shaking is coming first, and then is coming the awakening. I believe we're in that shaking right now, but there is great hope in that. 
if we will respond to the word of the Lord, if we will respond to the voice of God, if we will respond to what the Lord is speaking, what the Lord is doing, God is going to release a great awakening throughout this country. I, I believe that with all my heart. I, I do. God is going to have, God is going to pour out his spirit. But before he pours out his spirit, he's got to do a work of purification in us, the vessels who will carry that great outpouring. The Lord spoke to me and said, stop praying for a, great, a third great awakening. The third great awakening is coming. Pray instead that the vessels who will carry that third great awakening will be completely purified. Their wineskins will be prepared to handle the outpouring that he's bringing. It's, God's going to bring a great awakening. That, that's in his heart. But he's got to have vessels. He's got to have messengers who are not fighting like, like Peter, who are not partially fighting for the Lord, but also wanting their own nation to be great, or wanting their own ministry to be great, or wanting their own kingdom to be great. We want Jesus to be great. That's the heart of the messenger. That's the heart of the kind of voices God is raising up. We want the Lord to be great. Not our kingdoms, not our ministries, not our, even our nation. We want the Lord himself to be great. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's just wait on the Lord right now. We can end the, the recording here. Just, let's, let's stand right now and just wait on the Lord. Let God have his way right now.